appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you today and uh, you'll notice in the cover slide here that uh, uh, Steve and I are listed as co-authors on this and this is a wedding of about 30 years of collaboration and I want to emphasize that now. It's uh, been a good, a good run. Pottlefish have many attributes that are important uh, as a potential <coughs> aquaculture species. Uh, biologically uh, being filter feeders uh, as one example and of course the products uh, that we're dealing with uh, valuable eggs and, and uh, the meat as well. I'd like to briefly review some of the important uh, considerations with uh, relation to induction of gynogenesis because they're really important to the interpretation of some of the data that we hope to uh, look at today. First of all, uh, the objective here, of course, is to produce a progeny group that has only maternal inheritance. And that's done largely through the use of a donor male and other species with some degree of compatibility in the spermatozoa. Uh, and in our case, we use the shovel nose sturgeon uh, as a further insurance policy against any potential hybridization, uh, we UV treat the spermatozoa to denature the DNA, but not sufficiently long to uh, interfere with the, the motility because we need that to stimulate the second meiotic division that occurs at the time of insemination or fertilization. Here, of course, we're not attempting fertilization because we're just using the sperm to activate that second meiotic division which then is uh, treated so as to retain that uh, second set of chromosomes that would normally be lost in the second polar body and produce an all maternal uh, set of individuals. And in, important to this is the optimization of the treatment itself. Uh, <laughs> there are about four variables that you have to deal with relative to this, one being the type of shock, whether it's pressure, or temperature, cold or hot, and we've chosen uh, heat shock as being a, a easily reproducible and treatable uh, component. The magnitude, how hot, uh, and uh, the duration, how long. Uh, those are three variables that you have to optimize uh, during the production of these gynogenic individuals. Lastly, the application time is all important. Uh, and the pre-shock incubation temperature changes the picture drastically. Uh, so you either have to maintain a consistent pre-shock incubation temperature or adjust it with uh, what uh, a unit of physiological activity that was, was uh, uh, first uh, described by uh, Detlav in Russia uh, called Tau sub zero. It's a very functional unit and we have used that uh, in our, our efforts. You can see from this scalar uh, example, if uh, you incubate at these different temperatures, how drastically different the time of polar body extrusion uh, is. And if you shock for two minutes and, and outside of this window of opportunity, you completely miss the chance for inducing the polar body retention. And that's why that that uh, control or the adjustment is very, very important to the uh, process itself. Next, we need to consider that if we're dealing with an all maternal uh, group of progeny, the sex determination of that group of progeny is all important depending on what your objectives are. And ours originally were to produce an all female population. The simplest model uh, was the XX one, which has been demonstrated in a numerous species of fishes. Uh, and so we went with, uh, as the cardinal rule in science is, to try to get the simplest explanation first. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. And th that's part of the data that uh, we'll look at today. We're dealing with probably what we would describe as a WZ, heterogametic female system. And so if you do gynogenesis on a group there, you can see that you're going to have different groups of progeny than you would if you had a homogametic XX type. Now, just to uh, take a look at this process using this premise now that we're uh, uh, putting forward, uh, if you have the 
uh, a second uh, second set of uh, chromosomes produced uh, in these two uh, options relative to the second meiotic division. You're theoretically you would either have a WW set of chromatids or a ZZ set of chromatids that at the shock time then would produce either WW or ZZ homogenetic uh, um, diploid progeny. And uh, this is, as I said, theoretical, but uh, as with often things in biology, they don't uh, quite pan out that way. Uh, Steve stocked uh, one group of gynecomotes uh, back in 1996, uh, and they were grown till uh, at least nine years of age, just coming into initial maturity for the females. Unfortunately, if we had probably delayed that another couple of years, the numbers might have looked a little different. But the important thing to emphasize here is that we had good, fertile, sperm-producing males uh, in the population. That tells us right away that XX is not the explanation for the system, but it doesn't fully explain why we have about 80% <coughs> females rather than 50%. But that, uh, again, goes back to the genetics of, of the, the uh, uh, ootogenetic process where the chromosomes are paired, there's some breakage, you get crossing over, and so you get some mixing up that may give you a WZ uh, genome in, in some of the project. Now, how do we identify that? That's where we're, that's our uh, uh, crossroads now. We want to look at this relative to identifying some of these mature gynogenotes and see if one thing, is the WW genotype viable and, uh, uh, and uh, there as it, it should be in theory. Uh, uh, so uh, that's basically our next step, and uh, we can actually do that in two different ways. Uh, one is do a second generation of gynogenesis, which carries with it some inherent problems, uh, but it has a much higher uh, payoff if we go that route. Uh, but the easiest way to progeny test would be to take normal males and to cross those individually with uh, the females of an un unknown genotype, either WZ, presumably, and hopefully a WW. If we choose a female that's WZ, then we're going to have a mixed sex progeny uh, uh, of both genotypes, ZZ and WZ, both <coughs> normal sex determining genotypes. If we are fortunate at to choose a WW female and it's a viable female that produces good eggs, uh, then all of the progeny will be WZ and females. And so we can at least have that uh, particular individual identified at that point. Uh, as I said, if we went this route, we can produce uh, uh, the possibility of a population of WW females which is a real, would be a real gold mine. But this is a second generation of gynogenesis, which is inbreeding, and uh, we might have some uh, uh, inbreeding depression associated with that that would come back and bite us in the rear end. So, uh, we're, at this point, uh, probably going to try both ways just to see. Uh, but uh, these data are not new. It, just in the last decade, information on sex determination in sturgeons has, has become, uh, has come into the literature. And so we know at least three sturgeon groups, the bester, which is a hybrid, the white sturgeon, the short nose, have a similar pattern of sex determination. Roughly uh, three quarters uh, of, the, of the offspring are females and a, a smaller percentage are males. <coughs> So what's next, as I said, uh, uh, the WW testing is, is tantamount to wh what uh, we want to uh, identify here. Is it a viable genotype? Uh, are, are the eggs fertile? Uh, and uh, uh, can we use that then in, in the planning for our future uh, uh, long-term programs? All these other uh, aspects are ancillary to that question right there. And, uh, would uh, kind of signal what uh, the potential in the future uh, might be. Whoops, went too far. So I think I have a few minutes of mm -hmm. here or something.